So tonight we're going to look at a number of different psalms, and so I hope you've got your track shoes on. We're going to be running a little bit and, uh, in our Bibles. The title is, What's Your Genre? And it's a little bit unusual because we think about genre in a lot of different ways. I was interested a couple of years ago talking with some young people, and, and uh, the word genre was something they were very familiar with because there's genres in uh, Apple tunes, and there's genres in all of the uh, iTunes that you see, and so they're, in, they're, they're interested in and they understand uh, the word genre as a different kind of style of music. But in the Bible, usually genre means a certain style of writing, like we have poetry, we have narrative, we have history, we have different kinds of writing. So what's your genre? Because tonight we're going to talk about some different kinds of psalms. In fact, we've been talking about different kinds of psalms already. Last all of those in uh, over time. Well, have you ever heard some of the funny country music song titles? You ever heard some of these? Some of these I know you've heard. Jesus, Take the Wheel. Yeah, I know you've heard, you've heard that. I uh, always thought that was uh, a little dangerous. Uh, I changed her oil. She changed my life. I don't know whether to kill myself or go bowling, you know? I keep forgetting that I forgot about you. Here's one that you'll like. I'm just a bug on the windshield of life. I've been flushed from the bathroom of your heart. If love were oil, I'd be a court low. <laughs> if my nose was full of nickels, I'd blow it all on you. If, if you leave me, can I come too? <laughs> one of my favorites from a long time ago by little Jimmy Dickens, May the bird of paradise fly up your nose. You probably remember that. Mama, get the hammer. There's a fly on Papa's head. <laughs> my everyday silver is plastic. My wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> I really like that. You guys remember this one. She got the gold mine, and I got the what? The shaft. That's right. Thank God and Greyhound, she's gone. You can't have your Kate and Edith, too. So you have to think about that a little bit. I remember this one as well. You can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. All right, who was that? Roger Miller. Roger Miller is right. Okay. You done tore out my heart and stomped that sucker flat. <laughs> this is one of my favorites, and this one will also make you think. I'm so miserable without you, it's like having you here. <laughs> <laughs> The last word in lonesome is me. And here's one, just, I've never heard this song, but I can just imagine. I just bought a car from a guy that stole my girl, but the, girl, the car don't run, so I figure we got an even deal. <laughs> I don't even know how you sing that. I just bought a car from the guy that stole my girl, but the car don't run, so I figure we got an even deal. Well, just like we have a lot of favorite songs, we also have favorite kinds of music, and maybe you have different... Uh, style or different favorites in genre. Maybe it's, maybe it's jazz, or maybe you like uh, classic, or maybe you like pop, or country, or those types. But like, we have different genres of music that people uh, sing about. You can find a psalm that expresses just about anything. Psalms capture the gamut of human emotion and experience, from happy to sad, joyful to despair, thankful to doubtful, expressing gratitude to anger, even wanting vengeance on those who wronged others. It's one of the reasons why Psalm speaks to us at such a deep level. Tonight we're going to take a tour of some different kinds of Psalms. And I think you'll identify with what they say and can think of a time in your life when you may have felt the same way too. The good news is, here's the good news, we can go to God in every season of life with whatever is happening and however we may feel and bring our deepest thoughts and feelings to Him, no matter what they are. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Psalm 1, and we're going to talk about the first one of these genres is songs of wisdom. It might surprise you to know that some psalms actually fall into the category of wisdom literature, because we think about songs or psalms as songs, or we think about them being used in the context of worship. But uh, actually, psalms are a classic example of wisdom literature, uh, in fact, if you think about the statement that we often think about with wisdom literature or Proverbs is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. wisdom. You know that's found first in the Psalms. It was, it's in Psalms 111, verse 10. 
One of the song, psalms that is a very good uh, example of wisdom literature is Psalm 1. We can't help but think about what defines a godly man or a godly woman when we read these words. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted by flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. This psalm describes the godly man or woman as one that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. In other words, the godly resist the pressure of the ungodly around them, whatever takes that form, whether it's culture or compromise, and instead they listen to, meditate, and follow the teachings of God's Word. That person, man or woman, will be like a tree planted by the water with roots that go deep and strong and will produce fruit that is lasting and profitable. That's not the way it is. builds his house on the sand. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. The one who built on the rock was the one who heard the words of Jesus and obeyed them. His house stood the test of time and tempest. The one who did not heed the words of Jesus lost everything in the, when the storm and flood came. That's not only a picture of what happens in this life, but in the life to come as well. Now, there's a couple of other psalms that really illustrate wisdom in a very powerful way. And one of them is in Psalm 14. So if you look over just a few pages to Psalm 14, we find this expression of wisdom. Here we find the same description that we find in the book of Proverbs about the fool. The fool is not necessarily someone who is just uh, foolish in the way they look at things, but they set themselves against God. They rebel against God. They don't pay attention to God's word. They walk their own way. And it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, this psalm has a twin. If you weren't aware of that, if you look at Psalm 53, Psalm 53 and Psalm 14 are almost identical, with just the exception of a couple of words. And I think that is to drive a point home. Whenever you find repetition in Scripture, it's usually to make a point. And this point is very clear, and that is that it's the fool who says that there is no God because ultimately the fool will answer to the God he doesn't believe in. He will stand before that very God that he has denied his existence. And so he is foolish in every way. And yet, the foolishness of the fool is extended to everyone in the sense that there is none that does good, no, not even one. Paul will pick up on this in Romans chapter 3, and he will use these very words to describe the sinfulness of humanity. And what that tells us is that without God, we are all fools. And that the only way to come out of that foolishness is by recognizing that he is God. That's why it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know what uh, National Atheist Day is? April Fool's Day. Every year on April the 1st, I always say, Happy Atheist Day, because the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if you want to turn over a few more psalms to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Who was it? Someone here told me that thir Psalm 37 was one of their favorites. Who is it? Okay, right here. So a couple of people. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 also has a twin psalm, all right? And the twin to Psalm 37 is to reverse the numbers. Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 are very similar, all right? So Psalm 37 is from the perspective of not being envious of or worried about the prosperity of the one who is a fool or who is wicked, but prospers. They seem to have all the money, seem to have all the fun, seem to have all the, all the things that they need while the righteous person may struggle and may not have the things that they, uh, that, that they desire. Psalm 73 is the same idea, but the psalmist says, 
I almost despaired. I, I almost gave up when I saw the prosperity of the wicked until I saw their end. The Lord has put their feet on slippery places. So let's, uh, let's read the first few verses. Psalm 37. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass. They wilt like tender plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only be, it only bring harm. So he says, you, you can't look at others and feel like somehow this is unfair because God is going to take care of you. He's going to meet your needs. In fact, a little later in this psalm, he says, I have never seen the children of the righteous begging for bread. God provides for his own. And just because someone who is not following him seems to prosper, they need to realize that is only temporary. Verse 2 says, They wither quickly like grass, and they wilt like green plants. In Psalm 73, it says it a little bit differently. It says that he realizes that their feet are on slippery places and they lose all that they have with one heartbeat. Again, if you want a good New Testament example of this, then you look at Jesus' parable of the rich fool who continued to build bigger and bigger barns and have more and more things and one night his life was required of him and he wasn't ready. He had not prepared his soul because he had been so consumed with his earthly possessions. Psalm 73 has a great quote, and I'll give it to you. Psalm 73, verse 25, the psalmist says, Whom do I have in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. That's really what we get to when we come to Psalm 37, 4, when it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. When you really delight yourself in the Lord, then what you find is that he is the desire of your heart. He's the one that you desire more than anything or anyone else. Verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. That's wisdom. And those are great examples of songs of wisdom that you'll find all through the book of Psalms. Now let's turn to a, a different kind of psalm, a different kind of song, songs of lament. One of the things you find in the book of Psalms is the very deep experiences of people that sometimes feel very far away from God. The, the experiences in life where you wonder, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Are you even listening to me? Where are you? A great example of that is in Psalm 13. Psalm 13 is, is, uh, kind of gives us a, a full orb, kind of a full picture of what this... Uh, what this looks like as a psalm of lament. One ancient saint has called this type of experience the dark night of the soul. And maybe you've had that kind of experience where you wondered where God is. There seems to be times of spiritual dryness and darkness in our lives that we may really struggle in our relationship with God. And uh, that's, that's what he's experiencing. Psalm 13 says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? Consider me and answer, Lord my God. Restore brightness to my eyes. Otherwise, I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have triumphed over him and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me graciously. So you see David as he is experiencing this, this time of great, great agony. And maybe this was one of those times where he was hiding, or maybe it was one of the times he was, he was running away. Maybe it's one of the times where he had experienced uh, betrayal in his life. But for whatever reason, he feels that God is far away and that expresses some of our own feelings of doubt and disappointment. 
And yet, David comes back to hoping in God and trusting Him even in the valley of the shadow of death. David starts out wondering if God would forget him forever and why he seemed so hidden. In the midst of that, he cries out to God and asks the Lord to restore him. In the end, he places his trust in God and confidence and will rejoice in God's deliverance. Now, you'll find several psalms like that throughout the book of Psalms. And when you come across those, I don't think they're meant to cause us uh, to, to be troubled, but to identify with those experiences that we may have in life as well. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn back a couple of psalms to Psalm 10. And I want to talk about a different kind of song of lament. Because songs of lament sometimes go even a step further. Sometimes we call these imprecatory psalms. Let me give you a little bit of definition about what that means. An imprecatory psalm means it's a psalm in which the psalmist is actually calling for God to bring judgment and vengeance on someone else. Now, we have a hard time with that. I mean, it's hard for me to read those. It's like, whoa, what are we talking about here? You know, I thought we were supposed to bless those who persecute us and love our enemies. And yet these psalms express very clearly a desire for God to bring punishment to these people. Now, for us, it's hard to identify with that because it seems hateful. It seems mean to do so, but it's, it's a reflection of biblical truth. And the biblical truth that this reflects is there is going to be justice. And we serve a God of justice. And in the end, he's going to make all things right. And those who have done harm to others will answer to God for what they have done. And in a very deep sense, it's something that as human beings, we we understand because we've seen people suffer at the hands of others. Even in the book of Revelation, we find those that were martyred for the faith will cry out to God and they say, O oh Lord, how long? How long until you avenge our blood that was shed? So there's this idea of justice. Look at, verse, uh, at, uh, at Psalm 10. Lord, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide in times of trouble? There's that lament. In arrogance, the wicked relentlessly pursue their victims. Let them be caught. His eyes are on the lookout for the helpless. He lurks, like a, lurks in secret like a lion in a thicket. He lurks in order to seize a victim. He seizes a victim and drags him in his net. So he is oppressed and beaten down. Helpless people fall because of the wicked one's strength. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He hides his faith, face and will never see. Rise up, Lord God. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the oppressed. Why is the wicked person despised God? He says to himself, you will not demand an account. But you yourself have seen trouble and grief, observing it in order to take the matter into your hands. The helpless one entrusts himself to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked, evil person until you look for his wickedness, but it can't be found. Wow. That's, that's some pretty tough things. Lord, break his arm. Now, you think that's severe until you read over in Psalm 137, which we're not going to read tonight. But in Psalm 137, it ends that psalm by saying, blessed is the one who dashes your little ones against the stone. And we think, how in the world is that in the Bible? But you read the first part of Psalm 137 and you, you re realize why. By the waters of Babylon, the psalmist says, we, we hung our harps and we wept because they were in exile. Their, their city had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And then these Babylonians come and say, oh, sing us some of your songs. Sing us the songs of Zion. We want to hear those songs that you sing. They were mocking them. They were in deep pain. They had done all of these things. And they were filled with that kind of emotion. They wanted God to bring justice. We live in a country where we have a measure of justice. When something happens to someone, we, we know we can call law enforcement or we know that, that we, can, we have a recourse. 
But in many places in the ancient world, there was no recourse. People could be killed, flocks stolen, lands taken. No one was there to prevent that. And so there's this, this agony that people experience and crying out to God for that. It's interesting because we hear a lot of talk today about justice. Many people who are calling for justice don't really understand what justice really is or how it will be carried out in the end. There will be justice, but it won't look like what they're hoping for. It will be real justice because there is a God of justice, and he will bring justice on all injustice as it's defined in Scripture, not defined by humanity. It will be justice for those who have opposed God's purposes and his kingdom. It will be justice for those who have persecuted his people and harmed the innocent. It will be justice for those who have clamored for the right to do what they please, even though it flies in the face of what God says is right. There will be justice, and it won't be pretty. But it will reflect the holiness and sovereignty of God. We can lean into that when we see persecution and violence in the world. We can lean on that when it feels like God is not seeing or hearing what's happening. We, uh, we begin to identify with these words and these songs of lament. That's tough. It's heavy. And yet, we recognize that God does take note of what's happening in the world, and there will be justice for those who have done violence or injustice to others. So let's turn. Let's, uh, let's make it a little bit lighter now and look, look at some psalms of praise. You should be in the first, still in the first part of psalm, so let's go to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. There are songs of praise throughout the book of Psalms. In fact, it's full of them. But these two in particular I want to talk about really praise God for his creation. And uh, they teach us some very beautiful things. Psalm 8 is uh, one that praises God for his mighty work in creating the universe, but especially the creation of humanity. On top of all of his amazing and marvelous work uh, in creating mankind, he's given us a special place with a special role, and he takes special care of us. The Bible is very clear that mankind is the pinnacle of God's creation. He places mankind in the center of creation and elevates him to the highest place in the created order. And that's the point that this psalm makes. So let's read these words. Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. What an incredible expression of God's creation and the place that he has given us as mankind. The point of the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2 was that God saved himself. What an important truth in a world that today seems to regard humanity with some disdain and says we have no right to be treated differently than other animals. When in truth, we are created specially by God in his image. The psalmist's response is to extol praise for God at the beginning and the end of this psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. That exclamation forms bookends on both ends of this psalm. And it's a literary device called an inclusio. And what it means is that everything on the inside between those two things is included in this expression of praise. And what's the expression of praise? Praise that God has created humanity to have dominion over all of his creation. It's a beautiful expression of praise to God. Now, another psalm that expresses praise for God's creation is Psalm 19. So look over in Psalm 19, and I think we'll find uh, 
a, a very interesting psalm here. Like Psalm 8, it begins by saying that God's glory can be seen in his creation. But it moves further. Let's read these words. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words their voice, where their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the end, or to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So this psalm tells us that God's glory can be seen in creation. People can recognize there's a God by looking at the universe, the stars, the world itself, and he has revealed himself in creation. Nevertheless, as we learn later in Romans chapter 1, the fact that God has revealed himself in creation doesn't necessarily mean people have enough knowledge about God to really understand and follow who he is, understand his ways. Paul says that even pe though people deep down know that God exists, they neither seek him nor know him. We need revelation to show us who God is and what he is like. So that's why as this psalm progresses, talking about this revelation of God from, uh, from all of uh, the heavens and uh, the atmosphere and all of God's creation, notice what it says in verse 7. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. Sounds very much like the first part of the book of Proverbs. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So here's what we find in this psalm. God has revealed himself in creation, his majesty and all the things that he has created in the stars and the sky and all of the heavens. And yet, that's not enough to really know who God is or what he wants us to do. So God has revealed more in his word, specifically what he is like and who he is. That's because we don't have enough knowledge just by looking at creation to know him. We know there's a God, but we don't believe him or follow him. That's what Paul says. But God has given us his word to reveal himself, his instructions, and his ways. This sometimes is called two different kinds of revelation. God's revealed himself in creation. We call that general revelation. But he's revealed himself in his word. We call that specific or special revelation. But the ultimate revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ. He became man so that we might know his character and know who he is and know about his love for us. The end result for the psalmist here is to pray that God will forgive him. He will keep him from unintentional sins. And then he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he didn't learn about God being his rock and his redeemer from, from looking at nature. He learned that from God's word. And that brings us to the last kind of song that we're going to talk about tonight, and that is a song of thanksgiving. Songs of thanksgiving. These songs particularly thank God for what he has done. And we see them throughout the book of Psalms. Sometimes it will recount all of their history, things that God has done to deliver them and bring them where they are. But as we look at these Psalms, we see some of, their, uh, some of them are our favorite songs. So you should still be in Psalm 18, or excuse me, 19. So let's go back one page to Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is a pretty long psalm. We're not going to read through all of it tonight. But there's only two psalms that really give specific location uh, and background to what that psalm was written about. This is one of those. It says this psalm, in the, in the uh, title it says, 
uh, of the servant of the Lord David, who spoke the words of this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the power of Saul. The only other one that gives background information is what we'll look at tomorrow night, Psalm 51. It's the one that David writes after he was confronted by Nathan about his, uh, his uh, sin with Bathsheba. This psalm of thanksgiving praises God for how God had delivered him, gives thanks to God for how he has delivered him. Look at Psalm 18.1. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. Then in verse 6, he says, I called to the Lord in my distress. I cried to my God for help. So this is David's testimony. He, he was desperate. There wasn't anything he could do. He needed God's protection. And when he asked for God's protection, God gave him that protection. He gives seven different images of how God had protected him and delivered him in this psalm. He calls God his strength, his rock, his fortress, his deliverer, his refuge, his shield, the horn of his salvation, and his shield. He says, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. What a beautiful expression of thanksgiving that David gets here. David's time, this time in David's life, was a time when he experienced great power from God. And that's because he had no one else to turn to. God was his only source of strength and deliverance. Later on in David's life, when he has a lot more, we find David beginning it's the same way he was when he faced the, the giant Goliath. He says, I come at Goliath. I come to you in the name of the Lord our God, and he will deliver you into my hand today. When David was trusting in God, he experienced this kind of deliverance. As I heard it said one time, we need to be more like David the shepherd boy than David the king. Because David the king forgot where all of his blessings and resources came from, where his strength really was. But in this psalm, it is fresh on his mind. We see the same kind of thanksgiving reflected in Psalm 103. And uh, if you want to, you can go over to Psalm 103. But in Psalm 103, here's what the psalmist says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. And then he begins to recount some of those benefits. This is what he says. If I can find my page. Here we are. He forgives your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. Again, just like there were seven images of God as the one who delivered David, there are seven different activities that the that uh, the psalmist praises God for here. Uh, David says he forgives, he heals, he redeems, he loves, he satisfies, he gives justice for the oppressed, and he reveals himself to us. There is so much for David to give thanks for. He continues all the way through this psalm. A little bit later in Psalm 136, we're reminded to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. And that psalm repeats that over and over and over again as it talks about the things that God has done. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Those are psalms of thanksgiving. Well, I have been waiting for some time to, uh, to share the story I'm going to share tonight. Uh, many of you have probably heard this story, but I came across this story in uh, Greg Laurie's biography of Billy Graham uh, called Billy Graham, The Man I Knew. It's a, it's a new biography of Billy Graham. There's not a lot that I learned that was new, except that his relationship with Greg Laurie was, uh, was very special. But this story comes out of the Los Angeles crusade that Billy Graham had in 1949, what some people say was really the, the launching of his ministry. Uh, it was something that was uh, designed to last only a couple of weeks, and it ended up lasting 
for several months. The story comes uh, from a man by the name of Stuart Hamblin. Hamblin was a Methodist, was the son of a Methodist minister, and was considered radio's first cowboy, first singing cowboy. He lived a life of drinking and partying before reluctantly attending a Billy Graham crusade with his wife in 1949. He met Billy Graham when he appeared on his radio show, and he was talking about that crusade. The night that he attended the crusade, Billy Graham was reported to have said this, there is a man in the audience here who is a big fake. While many felt like maybe they were, he was talking to them, Hamblin sure, was sure he was talking about him. Several days later, he arrived at Billy Graham's door. You can show this next slide if you can. There's a picture of three guys. There we are. The next day, or several days later, he arrived at Billy Graham's door at 2 in the afternoon. He was drunk and demanded that Billy Graham pray for him. The two men spoke as the gospel was shared, and about three hours later, Stuart Hamblin gave his life to Christ. Hamblin completely changed his life and ways and eventually lost his radio show when he refused to promote alcohol. When a friend asked how he had changed his ways, he replied, it is no secret what God can do in a man's life. The friend said, that's a beautiful thought. You should write a song about that. Hamblin tells the story himself. I wrote the song one night shortly after midnight. My wife and I had been visiting one of Hollywood's most famous movie stars to our house. I began to think about it. When we arrived at home, I walked into the living room and sat down at the organ. Our hall clock began to chime the hour of midnight. I grabbed a pen and started writing. The chimes of time ring out the news. Another day is through. And on and on until the song was finished. Then I turned and glanced at the hall clock. It was only 17 minutes after midnight. I couldn't believe it. I'd never been able to write any musical composition in less than three or four hours. I thought the clock had stopped. Then I looked and saw the big pendulum still swinging. So who was that friend? It was none other than John Wayne. It is no secret, was written and recorded in 1950. The song is said to have been translated into more than 50 languages. The original manuscript to It Is No Secret is buried in the cornerstone. It's a lasting memorial to a song of praise. There is no power can conquer you while God is on your side, even alcohol itself. Take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do.